Hello, I'm David Robertson, and this is another educational video brought to you by artistblacksmith.com. Today we're going to take a billet of ladder Damascus steel and turn it into a working knife. Uh, I've used pattern to create this steel before, and we'll be using the gas forge, working with that to create the knife. Lots of grinding involved. I'll use this two small pieces such as this for the bolster and I'll talk about how I secure that to the steel but first I end up forging it to shape. I start with the point, work on the billet and you can see I'll start by cutting off the tip and I'm hot cutting here good bright yellow temperature when you're doing a hot cut especially when you're working with tool steel it's very hard to cut through otherwise the gas forge is just outside the picture frame but you can see I'm pulling it out it comes out at a, a bright yellow I'm using pliers to break the cut on the tip and that gives me my diagonal cut So I work hard on that top corner. The actual edge is on the long side. Most people think that the edge develops on the top side, and that's not true. It's on the bottom side that's closest to the anvil right now. The forging is quite simple here. I'm really just drawing the point out. I don't want to change the length of the material because I'll end up distorting the pattern significantly. So really I'm just pointing the bar and then I'll turn it around and I'll nip off the corners of the back end to form the handle. It's very simple forge work. You can see the general shape now. Most of the work is done with the grinding. So here I'm nipping off the two corners on the other end. And again, remember when you're finished with your hot cut to take it out. You don't want it to remain in your anvil. So I've got that slightly rounded off, slightly mm, 45 degrees in just the corners. And then I'll come in with the hammer again and round those corners off. The actual forge work on the blades takes a minimal amount of time. There's a great deal of time in creating the Damascus billet, but the actual forging the knife out once you've got a flat piece of steel is pretty quick. And then, all the time, the majority of the time, is spent grinding with various grits, shape profiling and sanding down, um, plus heat treating. So I'm putting just a little bit of a curvature in the handle right now. Generally, you want your knife to come with the handle straight off. Don't put too much curvature in or else it will be awkward in the hand. It should be a natural extension of your hand. So you can see a very general shape, just a gentle curvature. It's important to make sure that everything is absolutely flat, as flat as you can get it. You can do a little bit of grinding once you've um, finished heat treating and everything. Right now I'm doing thermal cycling. So this is on top of a piece of kale wool. And I start at essentially a bright orange. The photography is a little bit washed out with this. And then I let it cool to a black heat. I do this um, several cycles, three times. And I start at bright orange and then a medium orange and then at a bright red I bury it in vermiculite. Here's the burying in vermiculite process. It's just a box and the vermiculite is just simply an insulator that doesn't burn. And I place the knife in and then I'll pour vermiculite on top. And this creates an annealing step so the material will be as soft as possible. Because I'll next have to drill through the handle. 
I'll let this sit for a minimum of two hours. It's better overnight. So here we are after it's sat for a couple of hours. You can see a bit of the pattern in the video. And now I do what I call profile grinding. And I'll use either a bench grinder or an angle grinder. And basically I'll just create the silhouette of the knife. I use this clamping system to hold the blade onto a 2x4 that's clamped in the post vise. And I found that this is the best way to actually see what I'm doing with grinding and the safest way um, because I can support the whole blade on the block of wood and then just overhang either side the edge that I'm working on. And these clamps are simple to make. It's just uh, two pieces of flat bar with long bolts put through and then a, a welded handle on the end of the bolt. And you can use a magic marker to sketch out your silhouette on your blade. And then just slowly work. You'll see I'll come in with the angle grinder. Now I'm doing face first here and you can see it's nice to have the blade supported. So I use the angle grinder to do the initial surface grind on the steel. This gets through all the scale and gets me down to bare metal. It, the scale is um, very abrasive and if you go straight to your belt grinder with that, then it will dull your belt very quickly. Now here I've switched over to my belt sander. It is a 2 by 72 inch belt sander and it runs on a 1.5 horsepower motor. And what I'm doing right now is just flattening out both sides of the blade. Trying to get nice flat surfaces to start from. You can see it's hitting all the high ridges there and smoothing everything out. The sanding process takes a long time and you work up in various grits. This starting grit that I use is a 36 grit and you can see it really hogs off the metal quite quickly. But it gives a nice smooth flat plane and then I can go up with finer and finer grits from there. You can get belts that will actually go up as high as uh, putting a mirror polish on. But I usually don't take my knives to that point and I don't with the Damascus because I'll be etching the blade afterwards and there's no point in going to a mirror finish with it. So you can see I take my time, I do both sides, smooth them all out. mainly hitting the high spots so I've got nice flat planes to work with. So this grinding is primarily in preparation for doing the next stages of grinding but to weld on and then braze on the bolsters. Now the bolsters are made out of the same material as the billet they're just small cut off sections. And you'll see in the next clip coming up um, that I've welded them on. And this is just done with a MIG welder and I weld on to the back and the belly of the knife. I don't do the edges at all. You can see I'm getting a nice flat profile a little bit at the end I have to clean up. So you can see the MIG welding helmet. And then what I've done, I've clamped the pieces onto the knife exactly where I want them. And then I've just done a tack weld, top and bottom. Now this tack weld, once it's brazed, I'll be able to actually grind off down into the bare metal and it completely disappears. You'll see the tabs, the bolsters in a second. And I just use C-clamps or C-clamp vice grips. There's a good shot of the, the bolsters there. Now that's just tack welded, no brazing done. Now the reason I copper braze is copper has a higher melting point than the point that you quench the knife at to harden it. So it won't melt when I put it in the forge and bring it up to the critical temperature for quenching. Now when I braze, I start from the front end of the knife, what's visible first. 
and I heat up both the blade and the bolster you'll see that in the next clip and I slowly melt the copper in this does take some practice and it will actually wick in between the two metals the two pieces of steel on either side now I'm using just simple electrical copper wire except I've warmed the end up and I've dipped it in um, borax practice this on mild steel first um, it's a good strong hold some people do silver soldering but the silver solder melts at a much lower temperature than the copper does um, and I find it's pretty well as strong as the copper but I like the fact that I can just put the knife directly in the forge now I don't have to silver solder after I've heat treated the knife so basically you get a nice warm hot um, area on both the knife and the bolster and then you, you slowly feed the copper in and once you get the pieces hot enough with the flux on it the copper will wick right into the crevices now obviously I have to do both sides and I do both sides from the front first and then I'll switch it around you'll see it clamped in the vise and I'll do the back side where the handle is the reason I do the front first is that I can make sure that I fill in any pits or holes that may be in the copper. If there's pits and holes in the back side where the handle is, it's never seen. It may not be structurally as strong, but you don't have to worry about it being visible. I use an oxypropane torch. You could use an oxyacetylene torch the temperatures you're reaching are quite high to get everything to flow and melt you can see I'm taking time to heat up the bottom part of the steel as well so that the copper flows it'll only flow where it's hot enough to work to and there I'm dipping in it's almost like soldering but it's at a much higher temperature Once I have this all brazed together, both sides, top and bottom, then I can go in heavily with the grinder and grind off that MIG weld. If you just sand the MIG weld off and leave it there, when you go to etch, you'll see it, and it's quite ugly in the etching process. So it's always good to take your time, have a wider knife than what you want or what you need, and if you use this MIG welding technique, then be sure to grind all oh, about a sixteenth of an inch below the weld that usually is adequate heating the other side same process and just dip the copper in and then I use the torch back and forth to make the heat flow and the copper to wick into the hot areas again practice this this can be fairly slow going but take your time if you're making a valuable knife there is no point in rushing any step of it you can see my copper gets used up and I'll warm it up a little bit and then I just dip it in the flux and that puts enough of a coating on that I can carry on it's really not a lot of flux that you need to do this so I've done the weld, I've done the braze both sides now I come in with the angle grinder and I do my final profiling so I have things clamped be cautious when you're working this way you can see I have the point over the edge of the block of wood now I hang my angle grinders up right beside the vise some people put them on the floor and every time you go up and down from the floor there's a risk of poking yourself with a knife of course the sharper it gets the worse that is so the initial bit was done with the angle grinder and then I move back over to the belt sander and I do my final profiling. So this is cleaning up all the ragged edges and developing a little bit of smoothness on the back and I'll also come in and I'll round off those bolsters into the shape that I want for the handle.
this takes a little bit of time. You can see I'm using a push stick here if your fingers are getting a little close. And this is just a piece of wood that I can apply pressure on the belt with. Try and use long continuous overlapping lines. That will create the smoothest structures, both on edge and on the flap of the knife. Now, if you've got tight curves, you may want to go to a smaller belt sander. And you'll see in a clip coming up where some final tight work I'm doing on a one inch belt sander. Yeah, you can see the knife is beginning to take a, a general profile. I've rounded the bolsters a little bit. I'll do some more work with that. And you'll have to experiment with your own tools to see what type of angles you can get. So I'm trying to create sort of a domed surface. That's why I'm working at this angle on the knife. Domed surface on the, the bolsters. So there's a smooth transition from the wooden handle into the actual blade portion. Again, grinding is where you're going to spend most of your time. It's very, very detailed oriented. You don't rush it. Things need to be even. Things need to be proportioned right. Let's see, I've smoothed that over a little bit. And it's all detail work. With knife making, it's detail work. So here I've drawn, using a magic marker, where I want the actual blade edge to start. And I'm basically going to sand the metal down. It's essentially a flat bar right now. It's about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick all the way out to the edge. So now I'm creating the taper on the edge itself. I created a small notch there. This separates the cutting edge from the back portion of the knife. Allows you to easily sharpen the edge. You can see the bolster. And those have thinned down quite a bit from what I originally had. The original pieces of steel were the original thickness of the billet, which was a quarter of an inch thick. They were about half an inch wide, and then the one inch uh, long. So here I'm working off the bottom wheel. This is one technique you can use. You can also work off the flat platen as I was in the, the last clip. You can see that up here. And if you want to be very precise about your work, you can actually create a jig so that you can get exactly the angle you want. Now I'm doing this all basically by eye and by feel. And, yeah, I'm pleased with that. So, heat treating the knife. I've warmed it up in the forge. You can see the bolsters on there. And I'm just taking it to the point it becomes slightly magnetic. And then I'm going to quench edge down in the bucket of water. I'm just warming it up at the moment in the forge. because I was a little bit below the point, it was still magnetic when I tested it with the magnet. And you want to go just past magnetic, and then as soon as you feel the slightest tug, then quench. So I should come out a little bit hotter. Yeah. And you can see I'm not worried about the tang. And I do use an up and down motion, but the whole blade is quenched, not part of it. Now, previous to this, um, I did drill uh, 3 16 holes in the handle. You can see one at the back end. You'll see them closer coming up. 
so now heat treating. So I've done the hardening step, and now this is tempering. I've also baked this in a toaster oven for an hour at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. So currently the whole edge, the whole blade, is the same temper, and that's a cutting edge temper. But you want to go in and make your back softer so that it has springiness and is not likely to break. So what I'm doing is I'm using the torch again and I'm holding the edge in a thin pan of water. It's about half an inch deep. And I heat the back of the steel up until it shows the blue color. And then I progress all the way out to the point, keeping the edge in the water all the time. If I let the blue get down onto the edge, I have to go back to my initial heat treating and harden it again. Again, this takes some patience, some time. You have to work away at this. And you can see the colors developing up on the back. So the very top of my back has gotten blue. It's basically spring hard. And that allows a lot of flexibility in the blade. I slowly work from basically the bolster all the way up to the tip being very careful at the tip because it's the thinnest. I don't want to get it too hot. You can see here I've clamped in my left hand with vice grips and then I'm just using the torch in my right hand. You can also clearly see the holes that I drilled previously and you want to do that long before you do any of the hardening steps um, otherwise you may not be able to drill through your handle at all and these holes are used for the pins, the brass pins that I use to secure the, the wood slabs on either side of the handle so I go back if one area isn't quite as far as I want it to be or as close to the edge then I'll add a little bit more heat there And I have the torch on a fairly low flame here. Again, you're only taking the back to about 520, 530 degrees. So you don't have to have it a blaring hot torch. So the next little photo will show you what I ended up with for heat treating. And you want to make sure that you cool the whole blade down in the water so that it doesn't progress. So basically blue on the back. You can see a little bit of pattern in the handle and on the blade itself. And the bolsters. So, back to the grinder. This is the one inch belt grinder. And I'm just doing a very fine cleanup. I have all my angles generated on the large belt sander. And the thickness of the edge right now is about thumbnail thickness. So it's not sharp and I will slowly work at taking that down to an actual sharp edge over the next series of sequences. Since the blade is hard now, anytime I actually work on the edge I have to be very careful that I don't overheat it. So I'll take one or two passes and dip it down in water, take another pass, dip it down in water, continuous process all the way along. Once again, if I get the blade too hot, then I have basically cooked the temper out of it, and I would have to go back and harden it and temper it again. See here, I'm coming in very carefully on the edge. Some more back work. Now here I've got the pins in, and I've got the wooden slabs on. And I'm really just rough grinding the wooden slabs. I want to leave extra so that after it's all glued together, I can come back in with the sander and clean it up true to the metal. So I'm basically just coming close and matching the metal at this point. Of course, I've had to fit the wood and everything and make sure the pins are in the right spot and drill the holes. So once I have the handle all fitted exactly the way I want, then I am going to etch the whole blade in acid. 
and you'll want rubber gloves, tongs, face mask, apron, all your regular acid uh, safety precautions with this. So I have the blade etched, or sorry, not etched, but ground my holes, and then I'm just using a pair of tongs, and this is my acid container. Now I use sulfuric acid, and sulfuric acid can be fairly quick if it's fresh. Um, you can also use nitric acid, which is a very deep, harsh etch. You can use ferric chloride, which is a softer etch, takes a lot longer. Um, it's also going to depend on the temperature of your acid. So I'm just adding a little bit to top up, so I'm pretty close to having the whole blade covered. I will switch it end for end. So obviously, you need a, a good, tall, sturdy plastic container. Um, this one is set in another Tupperware container, so any splashes of acid will get caught. And you can see the baking soda at the right hand side. That's a neutralizing agent in case any got splashed on the table or on me, my clothing. The big bucket in the background is clean water and that I'll use to rinse. It also has some baking soda in it to neutralize it. You'll have to experiment with your etch solutions to see time, what type you prefer to work with cost of acid. It's a lot of considerations here and the final look. Sulfuric is relatively easy to get for me and it's quite cost effective and it's a fairly fast etch. If it's a warm 80 degree room temperature acid I can usually get a decent etch in 20 minutes to half an hour. You can see a little bit of the patterning coming up there and the further clips you'll see it in more detail. I'm adding a little bit more baking soda to make sure everything's completely neutralized. And then I'll use my glove to rub it in. Basically making sure all the pores and cracks and crevices have been neutralized. Because what will happen if you don't neutralize the acid, it will still continue to eat and you get a really prominent rust line in one area or another. So I'm basically just making a paste of the baking soda and then washing that paste off in the bucket. Remember when you're diluting acid, always add acid to water, not water to acid. And if you're not familiar with working with acids, do a Google search, check out different acid procedures. You can see I wear the rubber gloves. Uh, splash apron is good. I use a leather apron, but a rubber apron would be better. Lots of cleaning, lots of washing with this. And the pattern should come up. If you do go through all the washing and you find that the pattern's not strong enough, there's no problem going back into the acid bath again and letting it sit for another 20 minutes or whatever is appropriate for the steel that you're working with. Some steels will etch better than others. You can see I'm confident now that I can use it in bare hands. You can see the pattern's developed. It's quite nice. Ladder pattern in this one. There's a close-up of it. And I have etched the handle as well, so that it will show in the back and the belly on the wood. So now I'll get into the actual assembly, gluing the handle on. So you can see that's essentially the finished blade. Those are my two handle slabs that I've previously fit and then ground to shape the holes in the handle for the pins close up there now the actual gluing so I want to be able to pin this together 
And as I said, I use 3 16 pins. You could use eighth inch, quarter inch, whatever suits you. Um, I'm using two-part epoxy. And I'm applying epoxy to both sides of the knife and the pins. Now, what I'm looking for is a little bit of squeeze out around the pins themselves, but not much, or very little actually, on the edges of the slabs. Because if I get a lot of uh, squeeze out of the glue when I clamp it together, which you'll see shortly, then I'm going to have to clean that glue up by grinding on the surface of the handle. Of course, if I grind, then I'm going to get below the etch that I already put in. So you can see I'm keeping most of the glue to the center of the, um, the handle. Now if I was just using a high carbon knife I would use more glue and I would expect a significant amount of squeeze out and then just go back in and grind it out, and sand it out. And that's no problem with that. I've left the pins extra long so that I'll have maybe, oh, three sixteenths, eighth of an inch sticking out either side of the, the wood. And then I'll go back in with a jeweler's saw and I'll cut them flush and then I'll sand them flush. If you grind them flush um, and generate a lot of heat, what will happen is that you actually release the epoxy. The epoxy is very strong, but it doesn't take heat well. So I tend to do very little sanding or very little grinding on the pins so I don't overheat them. Be cautious about that. So you can see I'm fitting the top scale on. This is a little bit fiddly work, but not too bad. Five minute epoxy is pretty quick. Um, you have to make sure all your pieces fit just fine and you're not going to run into any hazards because the epoxy will set up and then you've got a problem of cleaning it off or grinding it off if you get stuck. So make sure all your pieces fit together perfectly and you're not going to have any surprises. Half hour epoxy, a little bit better, you've got a longer set time. You can mess around with it a little bit more. Same thing on this side, I make sure the pins are covered and I stay to the center with the epoxy. I try not to have too much extra. Now whenever you epoxy, if you can, you want to clamp it. So I'll put the other scale on and then I'll actually clamp the um, two scales together quite tight and then I'll leave them, well in this case I left them overnight, but Typically I'll leave them for a couple hours to set up before I do any sanding or grind work on it. Uh, second scale. Just nestle it down into position. Make sure your pins don't move. You can see I press one pin back in there a little bit. Things should be snug, but they shouldn't bind. A few taps, get everything set up. So now I want to clamp that. Get my glue out of the way so I don't clamp get my glue dipped in my clamp or something. You could use C-clamps. Um, I like these little compression clamps. They seem to work fairly well and they're quick. If you're even stuck, you could probably clamp in your vise. Um, don't apply too much pressure because you don't want to mar the wood at all and you'd have to have uh, soft jaws in there. Pieces of uh, wood would typically work fine. Okay, so glued. Now I'm going to give the edge um, a final sharpening and I'm using what's called a Kratex wheel here and it's essentially um, a bench grinder wheel obviously 
but it's a rubber compound that has diamond um, grit in it. And this is usually used for polishing jewelry, but it will put a very, very sharp edge on a knife. And I just spend a little bit of time going back and forth, cleaning that edge up. I'll also go over the flat of the knife a bit with the Kratax wheel. And this helps highlight some of the, the patterning in it. You have to be careful with this because if you get too aggressive, what will happen is you'll actually smooth out the pattern and it disappears. So I'm looking directly over top of the knife and I can see exactly the angles that I'm coming at. Just like the grinding, this takes time, but you can get a really nice finish working with this type of wheel. You can also get smaller ones for Dremels, Dremel tools. Um, that works pretty well. You go through them faster, obviously. So I'm really just trying to highlight some of the patterning with this. I'm not trying to re remove a lot of material. It's more or less just cleaning up. Same thing on the other side. And again, you'll have to practice with different angles coming in. You'll find once you know your angles to work at, that you'll be able to repeat it on the belt sander, or on the angle grinder, or on the bench grinder. You go, oh yeah, this is how I got into this last one. So with this final buffing, essentially the knife is finished. That's the finished knife right there. Um, there'll be another photo coming up, slightly different lighting, different angle. but. With some simple techniques, you can make a really interesting, lovely piece that you would be prized at any knife show or prized to sell to family or friends or commercially. The main thing is experiment with the techniques, get a sense of them, practice. It's all about practice and then develop your own style and your own patterning with the Damascus work. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And for more information, please see artistblacksmith.com. Thanks very much.